The story of Christmas is recorded in the books of Matthew and Luke. The narrative of Matthew and Luke includes how Jesus was born and how the angels came and sang and how the wise men came and adored him. It is a detailed description of how Jesus came to this world. The book of John introduces Jesus a little differently. The book of John introduces the coming of Jesus, but in a more philosophical and spiritual, uh, spiritualized or philosophized way. That Jesus is the word of God. Jesus dwelled with God. He is the word that, that tabernacled among us, that became flesh and dwelled among us. So it's more of a philosophical and theological expression of the introduction of Jesus. In the gospel according to Mark, Mark is more, intro is more interested in action. He, he straight away gets into the action of the ministry of Jesus. This morning we will consider the narrative according to Matthew. For many of us, the Christmas story in the book of Matthew begins in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, began, came about. Because the first 17 verses for many of us is about genealogy, the lineage of Jesus, the family tree of Jesus, and it is boring. Many of us think, why is this genealogy here? And so we do not give it a second look. But let us explore the first 18 uh, first 17 verses this morning and see what we can draw out from this, from the seemingly unimportant verses of Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Let us try to explore and find out the loaded meaning which, which Matthew has taken pains to write it for all of us. Let's begin with the first perspective, the first thought. God keeps his promise. Isaiah 11 verse 1 says, A shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Isaiah prophesied that from the stump or from the line of Jesse, the king will come. It talks about King David his son, if we uh, look back and analyze that verse. The writing in the book of Psalms also talk about this, Psalm 132. We do not know if it was written by David or Solomon or some other person, but it records the same thing about David, which God has promised. Psalm 132, verses 11 to 12. The Lord swore an oath to David. A sure oath he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. Forever and ever. This psalm is a song of essence. In other words, the Israelites know this song. They sing this song individually and as a community. They are aware that God had promised David that his throne will not remain empty at any point of time because God is going to provide a king every time in every generation and the king will be there on the throne forever and ever. This psalm reminds the people that God has made a promise. And so they cry out to God. This psalm also reminds God that God, you have made a promise. And therefore, they pray to God. So whenever they go through national crisis or individual crisis in their lives and their family, this psalm gives them hope. The people wait for God to fulfill his promise. There's another psalm, Psalm 89, verses 3 to 4. 
This is again a sum of reflection, a sum of recollection, a sum of anticipation. In verse 3, you said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever, underline that, and make your throne firm through all generations. Verse 20, I have found David my servant with my, I have found David my servant with my sacred oil, I have anointed him. Verse 29, I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. Verse 36, that his line will endure forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. Verse 4, verse 29, verse 36, I will establish his line forever, his line forever, the foreverness of God's throne or God's kingdom or David's kingdom has been promised. The foreverness of David's throne and his kingdom through God had been promised. As the people of God went through humiliation, suffering, shame, exile, the people of God must be thinking, where is God? What is God doing? But promises like this keeps encouraging them. They must be, they must be asking when they go through national crisis, is, just, is God just blabbering or can we rely on God's word? But God is a reliable God, and we will see it below. Now, where is this exact statement or promise made by God? We call it the Davidic covenant in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. The foreverness of David's throne has been promised by God. The foreverness of David's throne. Human beings are not forever. There is something more to this promise. If 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel had been written in around 9th or 8th century, then Isaiah the prophet prophesied about this in the late 8th century or the beginning of the 7th century BCE. And Matthew, reading the book of Isaiah, reading the book of 1 and 2 Samuel, now declares in mid 60 AD, that this has come to its fulfillment. Matthew 1 verse 1, we have read. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. David is, Matthew is trying to say that what had been promised in the past has found its fulfillment. This is the Messiah, the son of David. Finally, the promise of God made so many years ago, 900 years ago, 900 or more years ago, has come to its fulfillment that he is the king in the line of David. Now in Matthew 29 verse 1, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest place. People may not have known many things yet. They may not have a clear understanding of Jesus yet, but they are beginning to see that Jesus is the friend. And many of them accepted that Jesus is the son of David. And Jesus 
was crucified on the cross as the king of the Jews. Matthew 27, 37. Let's pause now for some applications. Jesus comes to us as a king, not of human kingdom, but the king of heaven. Foreverness of the throne of David, the foreverness is not, is not for a human being made of flesh and blood, but the foreverness is for the divine king. And Jesus fits that puzzle piece. Jesus fits this foreverness promise. So if Jesus comes to us as the king of kings, not of king of kings, king of heaven, not of human kingdom, how should we relate to this king? How should you and how should I relate to this kingdom, to, to, to this king, this Christmas? The wise men from the east have given us a good model how to revere and worship this king, the posture and the attitude of worshiping this king. But they didn't have the privilege of seeing the death and crucifixion and resurrection of this king. We have much more reasons to worship this king. We have seen him uh, born and died and resurrected for our sins. And so if this wise men have worshipped God with, with gold, uh, myrrh and frankincense, how much more should we worship God and, and adore him and give him our lives and our heart? We have more reasons to be more humble to worship this king that has come from David's line. The genealogy of Jesus coming from David's line was also important to authenticate, to confirm, to validate, to make sure and establish the truth that Jesus was not a dubious imposter, that Jesus did not just claim like that. Matthew was taking pains to write the genealogy of Jesus to tell the people that Jesus is indeed from the line of David. He is not a dubious imposter. One day, what has been promised a long time ago will be fulfilled, and Jesus fulfilled that for us. He is the promise keeper. God is the promise keeper. He has fulfilled what he promised. And because he has fulfilled what he has promised, he is reliable. He is trustworthy. What are the things in your life and in my life that we have prayed to God and we seek his face and we have been asking him to fulfill? What is it in the word of God that has promised you and you're claiming that promise? Are you already tired? Are you already giving up? Is there some burden in your heart that you're praying for your father, mother, sister, brother, friends, colleague, husband, wife? And the word of God tells you that if you pray and seek his face, God will change and, and transform our lives, including our dear near ones, people whom we have burdened for and you have not been seeing the fruit, are you giving up? Because the promise given to David and the fulfillment took 900 years. Many of us, because of the long span of time, may give up and say, maybe God will not fulfill this in my life. But God is a promise-keeping God. The delay may be there, but he will accomplish it if it is in his will that we pray. Let us continue to trust this God who is a promise keeper. The genealogy of Jesus coming from the line of David is also important because it confirms the humanity of Jesus. That Jesus is not a theophany, the appearance of God like in, in human form, but exactly not human. He is not like that. He is not a phantom or a ghost. He came in human form to understand our situation, our pain and our suffering. And Matthew's genealogy is important to trace the line of Jesus to David to say that he was indeed from this line and therefore he had flesh and blood. He was from the seed of a woman. 
And we trace it to Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, when God declared war against Satan, saying that the seed of this woman will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And this, and this promise is now finding its fulfillment in flesh and blood. The humanity of Jesus is important for our salvation. And Matthew is taking pains to introduce and to confirm that he had flesh and blood because he came from the line of David. Now let's talk about the second idea. God gives dignity to the downtrodden. In verses 1 to 17, if we look at it, we will see that God gives dignity to the downtrodden. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, Matthew chapter 1, verses 3, 5, and 6. Women rarely figured in the genealogy of the Jews in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 11. We do not find women in the genealogies of the Old Testament. Only when it is written that this man had many sons and daughters, only then are women mentioned in the genealogy. Women had no respect and uh, less respect and social standing. They have no social standing, generally speaking, in the society. And we have discussed this in the previous sermons. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 describes an even desperate situation of women. This situation has come about because of the pride of women and because the father, the son, the brothers, the husbands have died in the battlefield. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. Isaiah 4.1 Such was the desperation because of the death and scarcity of men in the Jewish society. Coming as a punishment from God. If women had no status in the past, they have plunged even deeper to be without self-respect. But right after Isaiah wrote this first verse, in the next verse, he says, In that day, verse 2, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Isaiah chapter 4, four verse 2. This verse may have an immediate contextual application for the people, but the capital B in that branch, that branch of the Lord signifies the messianic promise that, that it also relates to the Messiah who will come and give dignity to the women. Messianic pro prophecy here envisions that women who were once downtrodden and disgraced will experience beauty and fruit, self-respect and honor will be respect to the uh, self-honor and respect will be given to the woman when the Messiah arrives. Now here in Matthew 1, Matthew breaks tradition and does the unprecedented by including women in the genealogy. Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, Tamar was included. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Rahab and Ruth are included. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, has been mentioned. He gives them a place in the history of the birth of Jesus. He gives them respect. By including this woman's name in the genealogy, Matthew is also showing that Jesus has come to show and to give respect to this kind of people, to give them status, self-respect, and social standing in the society, the downtrodden of the society. 
Matthew also wanted to demonstrate that God's purpose in this world is also fulfilled through this kind of people. The weak and the downtrodden, oppressed, people with low status, ordinary people like you and me. How do you feel this morning? Do you feel un unimportant? Do you feel unworthy? Have you come to a point in your life where you're so discouraged because of what others have done to you or because you have done to yourself that you have begun to disrespect yourself and you consider yourself unworthy? Jesus not only came to forgive your sins, that is the reason he has come, but he has also come to give you dignity. To be living in sin is to be living without dignity, yes. But we can also be living in low self-esteem, being treated badly by other people. He has come for you to lift up your dignity. Moreover, through ordinary people, weak people like you and me, God can do something beautiful. Something beautiful in your family, something beautiful in your office, something beautiful in your friend circle, something beautiful which you think you cannot do because you are weak. But remember, God is a promise-keeping God. He can do something through you and through me. He will fulfill it. Do you have a burden for your family? That some of them are still lost, that some of them are still unable to understand the path they are taking. Let us encourage ourselves this morning, remind ourselves this morning, that Jesus has come. And in his coming, he is using the weak, the oppressed people like, ordinary people like you and me to accomplish his purpose. And God can give us that privilege to do the same for our family and friends. Let us keep trusting in God. And thirdly, in this genealogy, we also find that God embraces the outcast. The second and the third point are similar, but I have differentiated it. God not only lives up the downtrodden, but God embraces the outcast. The marriages of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba were unusual. They were irregular. They were questionable in some sense. Perhaps Matthew, while writing about these four women, was also trying to show from the scripture to the Jewish believers, preparing their hearts about the unprecedented style of the birth of Jesus. The precedents that we can see from the scripture, preparing them that even Jesus' birth will be unusual. The grandmothers of Jesus' birth, the grandmothers of Jesus also had unusual marriages. And even Jesus' mother will have an unusual conception. But in all this, God has allowed, God has orchestrated, and God has enabled these unusual things to happen. People might have considered their marriages Outrageous, considered them as outcasts or ignored them, but God used them for his purpose. Is your life and is my life unusual? Because of our background, because of your marriage, or because of the marriage of your parents? Are you ignored? Are you considered an outcast? Remember, Jesus came to embrace the outcast. Jesus came to embrace you. If your heart is in the right place, he can transform you. He can transform me. And Christmas story is for ordinary people, forsaken people, downtrodden people like you and me. Apart from the unusual marriage, we see something else. These four women were foreigners, not even Jewish women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, were foreigners. 
They were not even members of the covenant people, the commonwealth of Israel. These women were foreigners. These women represents you and me, represents us before Christ forgave our sins. We were strangers of the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2.12 Before Christ, we were strangers of the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. We were also foreigners and strangers, but God embraced us. These women were embraced by God to fulfill his purpose. Tamar and Rahab were Canaanites. Ruth was a Moabitess, and Bathsheba's husband was a Hittite, and so she must have been a Hittite as well. They were all foreigners. So if Jewish women were not in the genealogy, and it is unthinkable for women to be in the genealogy, this is even more outrageous because foreign women, foreigners, are in the genealogy of the Jews. And Matthew is trying to show the outrageousness of the embrace of Jesus. Moreover, this passage mentioning about the great grandmothers of Jesus also tells us that if you are tracing the birth of Jesus, the lineage of Jesus, from the line of David to Jesus, there is, there, there is more, a twist in the plot. Jesus has Gentile blood. It is not only Jewish line, but Jesus has non-Jewish blood. It is not a surprise, therefore, to know that Jesus has a global vision in his mind, global vision for the salvation of mankind. God had you and me in mind when he declared war in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. A global, a universal scope for his love and salvation. Not only is the preparation and the packaging symbolical, but the announcement of the birth of Jesus is also symbolical. It is loaded with meaning. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 18, when the angels came and announced the birth of Jesus, the, 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 the shepherds were chosen. The news did not come, the breaking news did not come to the politicians in the palace or the king in the palace or in the secretariat. It happened in the wilderness to the shepherds. Shepherds were treated very badly. The nature of their profession also would have made them so rough and shabby and even uncouth and rude. They were considered cheap. They were considered unreliable. They were considered thieves, outcasts, and unacceptable and clean in the society. Even in the place of worship, in the temple, they were not respected. Even in the law court, their witness is not accepted. They were the outcast in the society. But by being the people who received the breaking news of heaven, their status just got uplifted or upgraded from economic class to business class. They went to worship God. The shepherd continued to remain shepherds, but their life changed. And W.H. Auden said, their lives truly began. Jesus came to embrace the outcast. And it is demonstrated in the accusation made, the, made by the Pharisees. You eat and drink with the sinners. And Jesus said, yes, that's why I have come. I have come for outcast. I have come for those who have no dignity, no self-respect. So much broken in the inside. No respect and dignity given to them. And Jesus has come to embrace such people. Do you feel in your heart that you are unworthy 
that you were a sinner. God sent his son for you and for me. If God has a preferential treatment to the poor, to the outcast, how are we treating our poor and the needy in our church? Physically speaking, I would even go to the extent of challenging you this morning. If you are planning to give some gift, something, a precious gift to some people among us, Give to somebody who cannot return the favor. Don't give to somebody who can give you back. True giving is giving to somebody who cannot return the favor. And that is what God did. God sent his son into the world as a gift. We cannot give God back for what Jesus had done in our lives. True giving is tested when we give a precious gift to somebody who cannot give you back. For some of us who will be traveling and spending Christmas with our family, I would encourage you that if you have a Christmas feast and you are collecting some money for the Christmas meal, pay for the fatherless. Look out for the orphans. Look out for the widow. Look out for those who are struggling and make this Christmas memorable and loved for those people. If we are in an area where we see poor people sleeping in the street, naked or without clothes and being frozen in the season of Christmas this time, we may do it as a church or individually as a family. Look out for one or two people at least and show the warmth of Christ the warmest news for the coldest souls. Why should we have the warm news of heaven and our souls be cold towards other people? Let's extend our love to other people. We cannot be an armchair believer or an ivory tower believer and refuse to, to step down and serve and love other people who are in need. If Jesus had made a preferential treatment towards the spiritually poor and downtrodden, sinners, cheats, outcasts, then what must our attitude be this Christmas? If the gospel is the warmest news in the coldest season of human souls due to sin, we cannot close our eyes to those who are feeling chilly this winter, spiritually speaking suffering emotional and spiritual challenges. There may be people who are living in broken homes. There may be people who are experiencing a broken life. Whether it is your neighbor or whether it is a colleague in your office, let us be sensitive and try to help them and pray for them and do something for them. A rich man who was a widower is a collector of art. He is a connoisseur. He loves art. And so he has collected art from different parts of the world and his house is filled with precious art. And his house has a gallery where he has collected so many precious things. The father had a son who also loved art. The father was so happy because his son had a brilliant eye and loves art. The father was very happy because with the son there is a future. But war came in and the son had to enlist for the war and the son went for the war. The father wanted to spend Christmas with the son. But war took the son away from home. He thought that on Christmas Day the son will come back for celebration. But even after, but after a few weeks, there was a news that his son was found missing in action. His worst fears were confirmed after a few days that his son took a bullet trying to help his friends in the battlefield 
pulling them to safety and to the medic. On Christmas Day, there was a knock at his door. When he opened the door, he saw a man. And the man introduced himself saying, I'm a friend of your son. He took the bullet for me to save me. I have come to you this morning to express my love and respect to you and also to give you a gift. I have painted a portrait of my friend, your son. And I was told that you are an art lover and I want you to keep this simple portrait in your art gallery. The father was so grateful. The father was so thankful. The father took the art and and the, the portrait and kept it in his gallery. Now the portrait of his son took the center stage in the gallery. The portrait is not costly or precious in terms of money in the market, but it is precious to him because it is the, it is the symbol, it is the portrait of his son. The striking feature of the son stood out and it gave him peace and tranquility to his troubled soul. After some time, the father also passed away. News spread that there is going to be an auction of all the precious paintings and portraits in that gallery. Many people travel from far and near to come and be a part of that auction and buy something for themselves. The auctioner stood up and the auctioner began by saying, we're going to start with the portrait of this young man with rupees 5,000, let us say. And he began, is there anybody who would like to bid this portrait? There was complete silence. Nobody wanted to buy that portrait. There was even a complaint from the crowd saying, we have traveled far and wide to buy precious things and not this random ordinary painting of a young man. Let us start with the main auction, please. The auctioner said, no, according to the will of the father, we have to start with this son, with his son. Anybody willing to pay for this portrait, rupees 5,000? There was a man sitting at the back saying, I have just 100 rupees. But I know this man, I know this father. They are known to me, I love them. I have come today just to see how the proceedings will go about and to see who will be buying the precious things because I know them, I love them, I want to be a part of this auction. And then the auctioner said, is there anybody else who can give more than rupees 100? Anybody more, anybody who can give more? There was pin drop silence. And then he said, rupees 100? Going once, going twice, gone, came down the gavel. And then he announced, ladies and gentlemen, the auction for this morning is over. People were shocked. They asked him for an explanation. We have come from far and wide and we are waiting for the main items to be auctioned. How can you say that the auction is over? The auctioner replied, according to the will of the father, anybody who gets the son gets everything else. Ladies and gentlemen, the auction is over. First John, Chapter 5, verse 12. Let's read from verse 11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Many of them thought that the portrait of the Son was unimportant. In fact, that was the most important thing that day. They did not know it. Many of us in this world think that Jesus is not important. That Jesus is just another teacher. But on that final day of judgment, He is going to be the most important person 
the greatest decision of our life would be to have accepted him, to have loved him, to have honored him, and to have made him the king and the lord of our lives. This Christmas, shall we do that? This Christmas, shall we make this recommitment to, to this king of kings and to this lord of lords and say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I accept you. You are the life. You are the king. And you are my savior.